So our goal with this RSS reader is to use um, some of the pretty awesome inherent features of 11D to be able to pull in data from RSS feeds, organize it, transform it, and then use templating features to create the dynamic views. And so we're partway through that part of the process, the templating part. I can do a quick recap of what we've done so far. Um, you can view the, the full repo out here. And if you're interested how we kind of went through it day by day, you can, of course, review the commit history and see how we kind of built this up. Um, but in particular, in the last stream, we were pretty much focused on how to save a last accessed date. And the idea with that is that we could calculate whether or not we had new items. So um, within our package, we created a custom custom build script using Node that we're running on both pre-start and post-build. And we learned how to incorporate uh, environment variables. So you can see we created an 11D environment variable for marking a process as dev and as um, build. But what this is doing is it's running a custom script that we created and we called it last accessed. And based on whether you're coming into it from any, in your dev environment or not, the idea is that for a local build, we want to move back our date pretty significantly so that we could actually represent some new data to work with, um, whether or not we actually have very fresh feeds. Um, versus when we run it on post build, so in other words, if it's sitting on a server, so an actual production environment, and if that server is running that build process for us, um, it saves the date when that build completes, that post build date. The idea with that is then if you then have a daily process, weekly process, and you know when the next time that builds on the production server, it's going to get uh, or mark new items from that time frame between the previous build and the current build and then reset again. So that's the strategy we landed on. And the reason we had to kind of go through this work of like saving this date in kind of a manual way, which by the way, I should mention it gets saved into our, dynamically it gets saved into this file right here. It's just exporting a timestamp based on that uh, criteria we just looked at. So it's either saving 30 days back or um, in a dev environment, or it's saving the current time in that post build um, state of things. Um, but the reason we had to do all that is because since we're dealing with a static site, we don't have a database behind this. So we can't just save to a database. <laughs> so this is our workaround for getting similar functionality, still being able to retain that important data point for this particular app. Um, anyway, that was the main focus for the last stream. So if you're interested in more and how that works and more details of what we went through to get there, um, check out the previous replay. And again, that will eventually be on the YouTube channel. So um, we'll be modifying some of the things that we did last time, kind of improving them as we learn a bit more about 11D templating today. Um, in particular, the other thing that we created was a a uh, filter called new count. And that was once we actually, you know, did did the work we needed with that last access date and were able to mark items based on that as new, we needed to output what that count was. So the initial solution that we did last week was creating a filter. And so this new count filter that is held in the 11D config file, that's the common place to hold them. Um, and so you can see our filter here and it's expecting an array. So our array of total feed items for that particular source. So in this case, for example, I'm looking at the word wrap section. There's two new items that we have noted. So when the filter is applied, it's getting this source data for word wrap, for example, and then filtering out to define um, how many of those are new. Um, and actually at this point, it's just returning the altered array. And then, excuse me, I clicked on the wrong thing there. 
And then we add the Nunjax filter of length and that finally gets us the count number. So that's the summary of what we accomplished last time. Our goal this time is to finish out um, various parts of the templating. And what we had also created was uh, these wireframes. We've looked at these a few times, but our goal today is to get our HTML in better order to match what's happening here. We're going to get through all the critical templating related features, um, but we're going to unfortunately not have time in this initial batch to do kind of one ideal bit of functionality, which is to figure out how to mark items as red. Um, I have ideas for that. Um, so we may circle back to this in a few months. And that part is also interesting because it's not directly related to necessarily explaining 11D features. It's just a nice to have for this particular application that we're working on. So the first thing we're going to do today is um, I would like to give us a little bit more time because we want a little bit more data returned to work with um, in terms of knowing whether something's new. So that I'm, I'm just gonna change our this last access date. I'm gonna set it back a bit more to 60 days. So, and I already have the 11D running, so it should update here. Oh, you know what? What we have to do because of how it works is we do have to restart our build because that's only going to refresh since we defined it as such as uh, on pre-start, so right before things generate. There we go. So we have one more showing up um, and now our count on WordRef has actually bumped up to three. Now, of course, this is just based on um, the current feeds that I've given it. Uh, the ultimate idea as well that I should mention is that the repo we have out here will turn into kind of a starter. So you'll be able to modify any of these things that we've defined. Um, a unique part of what we're building is that we're not developing a UI for you to manage it. Um, once we push it up to production, we're developing an 11 starter that you configure to meet your needs. So for those that have missed the way earlier feeds, um, or streams, <laughs> getting my terminology mixed up here. Um, we created this feeds directory and there is a JSON file per category where we're hosting our um, direct links out to the feeds we want to include. And again, this is our kind of workaround for not having a database. So it's kind of giving us equivalent functionality. Um, but again, it does mean that we are leaning on configuration rather than maintaining this through a UI or an external database. But it allows us to explore some of my favorite features of 11D and working with data. So yes, definitely look back at previous streams if you're more interested in those parts of how we built that. Cool, so now we've got this date bumped back. We don't really need to worry about the last access anymore. Um, I did wanna add one more feed in here just to give us a bit more um, content to test with. So you can see that showed up right away, the small CSS. And we have an interesting problem with what we did previously for this new count. What we're doing on the index page, the home page, is we are bringing in the entire data array that we are generating out of our feeds data file. So there's no filtration on it. It's not an 11 d collection or anything like that. It's it's just the, the general dump of all of our data. Now the problem with that is we no longer have access to that whole chunk when we are looking at views like our categories or when we're looking at views like an individual source. And that was another big emphasis of what we looked at last stream is how we dynamically create those views with pagination. And so, um, in other words, we're, we, after we leave the home page and leave this array, we no longer very easily have access to um, being able to figure out that new count based on our current system of using a filter. So we need to kind of alter our strategy here. And um, where we're generating the dynamic views, let me close some of these things so we can see a little better, is also within our feeds directory. And we created our own custom directory of paginate. And this is where we are creating the dynamic views. So in this case, 
this new count, what it needs to look at specifically is it needs to look at items within a particular source. And so what we can do with 11D is create a collection of those items and that will expose that collection, which is really just saved as an array through 11D, um, as a global thing that we can access anywhere in our views. So that way we're no longer tied to this main whole chunk of data. We can essentially scope it down just to the items. And by items, I mean um, the array that holds individual articles here. So we'd have an array for the modern CSS ones and an array for small CSS and so forth. So <clears throat> I'm going to go into my items file that we are doing the 11D concept of pagination. And just the TLDR on that is it lets us create dynamic pages from data. And what we had explored is that we had to use this before function to help us scope down this overall feeds so that we could get it down to the level of just items. And again, check out the previous stream for more details there. We really dove into that. Um, but the important thing that we need to add into this is we need to create a collection of these items. And the quickest way to do that with 11D is through the concept of tags. So we're going to add um, tags and we're going to tags, tag these as items. Um, now the other important step when you're creating a collection with tags via pagination is that if you only do this step, it's only going to grab the first item um, in the paginated array. So we have one more step in here and that is in the specifically the part dealing with pagination, we need to add what is uh, an option to add all pages to collection. So again, this is kind of the critical thing. If you're adding tags through pagination and you're only getting one back, this is what you're missing so that you get all of the things you're paginated added to the collection. So that, uh, that has created a collection. So actually we can, we can validate that super quick. Um, and maybe make it make a little more sense what I'm talking about when I say that we have a collection of items. If we go into our index, we'll just temporarily add a loop at the top. And so um, collections is the global object from 11 d And we are going to include the name that we used for their tags, which is items. And then it's just going to dive through and it's going to, um, it's not going to have this part yet. Um, we're going to add that in a second but it should output all the titles of every item that we have available. And yep, we do see that happening. So collections are extremely beneficial um, and tags is the quickest way to add them. There are other methods, um, but for our purposes on this project, that's gonna be what works best. Um, when you are doing a loop through a collections, you have to dive down one level to get any, anything attached to that item. Um, so the title is being added as um, essentially front matter data. And so um, that's another little thing that trips me up when I was first starting is we have to dive down one level into the data object to fetch anything attached to um, that item or that page. So if you noticed, we were trying to get something to represent the new, um, whether or not that was new. And so we need to actually expose that when this page is dynamically created. So we previously talked about that because we can't add front matter in the same way as we would by crafting this as a one-off page um, when we're using pagination, what we can do is add anything that we would typically put in uh, front matter into this 11D computed object. So we, we'd already previously added our title. Now there's a few more things that we need um, so that we can use this more flexibly across our different views. What we need to add for now is we need to be able to expose that this is a new item for our all important new count. And we also need to expose what source it's attached to. So um, we kind of picked up source as our term to mean the feed source. So in other words, you know, these items would have a source of modern CSS solutions. So those are the two important bits of info that we need in order to figure out the number of new items within any view. And let's uh, comment out 
well, actually, we saw this. It did do a little update there because we had the new. And so we now see that throwing out true um, for items that were marked as new. So anyway, just a quick validation on that as well. So the next thing we need to do is now that we have this data available, uh, we need to change our new count method. So again, currently we are using a filter for that, but now we have this collections object available. And the benefit of that is, again, it can be available in any of our views. We don't have to worry about having access to this overall feed object. So let's look at what, um, or how to construct that um, new alternative, which instead of a filter, we're going to use a short code. And that may be a familiar term for those of you that have WordPress experience, but a short code is going to let you construct um, kind of a consistent little piece of content that you can um, place anywhere in your templates. And it also optionally accepts some um, you know, variables to alter its behavior, or it also can be a paired shortcode. So something where you would actually pass a block of content in between paired tags um, for your purposes. So for our purposes, what we would like to do is we need this to accept the available items, um, which is why we created the collection. And then we're going to use the source to filter that down um, and then return the number of new items. And we're also, because this is a short code, um, it means that we can actually go ahead and return the HTML to render, which is very useful because we can go ahead and include our conditional here of whether um, to display anything or not based on if there are new items available. Based on getting those bits of data in, we're going to loop through our items um, and filter those out. And we're going to check, does the source equal the source that we're gonna pass into the short code? And then if it does, um, does that ISM also, is it also marked as new? So that will return our new items. And then based on whether uh, array is populated with anything, so we're gonna check its length, we're going to then return the uh, HTML that we'd like to use. Um, there's a few things going on here. Um, we're including a couple of spans here, but it's going to, uh, there's a third parameter that's coming in, which is a slug. Um, so it's gonna be a unique slug based on that particular source. And the idea is that we're using the slug to tie together the new item count with the title of the source. And we're doing that using um, the aria described by. The reason for that is that, um, well, we're doing two things for accessibility purposes. Rather than just showing a number, we're going to eventually um, style up this inclusively hidden class so that users of assistive technology, um, such as screen readers, will essentially be able to read, if there's three new items, it'll be three new items, and then there'll be a short pause and then this described by will point to this title and then it will read the title. So that way, because this item is gonna be kind of sitting off to itself as this number, we wanna make sure it is associated to what it's associated to. So three new items for this particular source. We can look at that a little bit more, um, how that works once we actually get it rendered onto the page. So we've created the short code, um, but we haven't actually swapped it out. So let's see what that looks like to change from our current filter to this short code. So here's where we have the current filter going on. And we had to do kind of some little bit of extra things when we did this initial filter, um, which is so worth going back and exploring this concept of setting a variable with nunchucks. So that's, that's an extra little thing we were able to explore doing it with that method. Um, we actually do still want to set a variable. Um, we've ended up using this feed title as a slug a few different places. I'm going to comment out what we're not going to use. Um, and so we're still going to use this set idea to instead move that um, kind of compilation of that slug into a variable. And then we can go ahead and, and swap it where that currently appears. And I think there's one more. Oh, that's the only place for that. Um, so now we're ready to actually use our short code. 
And we want this to appear right before the title. So we've switched to, let me give me some space around that. We switched to the shortcode format, which um, since it's not outputting a variable, we're using the curly width percentage sign. I'm in Nunjux. And now, instead of passing in this uh, feed items array, we're now looking at our collection of items, which still is ultimately array. And it's actually the same one that we, um, same format as the one we were initially pulling in. And then we're passing in the feed title, so the source value. And then finally, that feed slug that we just kind of compiled together. So let's save and hope we don't hit an error. <laughs> and it's worked. All right, so we've, we've got our short code coming in. That's this whole span that's coming in. And thanks to passing the uh, slug version, we've got the it connected with the re describe by. But we have one more step in order for this to actually work, which is to add the same value onto the H3 as an ID. So that's what this re describe by is. We don't have to add a um, hashtag in here. We're just pointing to the name of the ID. So we'll just come down here. That's the other reason we created our um, feed slug variable is to simplify adding it in this location as well. Um, so now those are tied together. However, we have one little problem with how our slug is being created. And that is for sources that have a little bit unusual formatting. So for my 11D rocks, the current slug function is not stripping the exclamation mark, which is not ideal. Um, so um, we're currently relying on the built-in slug filter, which is using the existing package called Slugify. And um, out on 11D Rocks, I have a tip about essentially making the slug filter more strict. So we're still going to use Slugify, but we're going to modify its options um, and place it in strict mode. And then you also have the option, if you notice any other characters that strict mode is not capturing, um, you can add those into the removal array. So it'll, it won't change what the filter is, it'll just change the op existing options for it. Um, and the where the place we hold that is in our 11D config file, and actually place this towards the top. Um, there's two steps here, there's adding the actual filter, um, but in order to prevent um, some build errors, we need to make sure that we reference that package. Um, you don't have to install it because it is um, already included with 11D, but if you're using some sort of linting, it might yell at you and you might have to <laughs> end up installing it. But okay, so I've just saved that and I didn't even have to restart 11D. Um, let's double check that it resolved that. And yes, it did. So turning on strict mode for Slugify, remove the exclamation mark um, and some other things. Um, uh, since I'm pulling in my own feeds uh, and they're about coding, sometimes I do use uh, like back ticks in the um, titles. And so it'll strip those out as well, which is handy. So we have our new count short code. Um, and thanks to creating that collection out of our items, we can access this in any view, um, which is useful because we want to continue showing this number of new items as we get into individual category pages where we have yet to add it and also individual source pages. So that was the reason we went through the work of doing those items. Now um, let's do just a slight bit of cleanup. We no longer need this filter that we previously created for new count. So we'll just go ahead and remove it so we don't get confused of what's, what's going on <laughs> between those two. At this point, we're going to see how, what updates do we need to make to more closely align with the output we want for each of these views. Um, looking at what we have now, we only have essentially the bare minimum. Um, we, we just kept uh, copying and pasting the, the list here, which is just the date and, and a link to um, the individual item, which by the way, we are actually hosting those individual items um, within our application. That's kind of a common feature that folks seem to want if it's provided by the feed source. So not every source is gonna provide truly the full content, um, but if they do, we're, we're going ahead and creating a page for it here. And a change that we will have to this view is a link out to the original article. 
And then when we get to the styling on Thursday, we will try to cover most use cases um, that that we are seeing in content. We won't get them all covered, but we'll improve the reading experience as much as we can. In order to create some of our other views, um, in particular, making sure we have access to the source data. Right now in our function that is doing all the work to parse through feeds that are incoming and convert those to an array that we're using in our views, we are only returning um, the feed title at a, at a top level. So that feed title is what we mean um, or what's being used for like uh, this, this title here, so the source title. And we'd also like to return at minimum um, a, the direct URL. So that way, when we get to those views, we can ultimately provide links back to the original source. Um, so we're just going to alter this array. Essentially, the modification we made was to also expose the site URL. So in other words, the original location um, that this feed is coming from. So um, if we look at our wireframes here, um, we, we have most of this in place. We added our new count this morning and readjusted that. We'd already linked this. We had the date and the, um, the link to the individual item. What we don't currently have represented 100% is the new. Um, we do, but we don't. We'd like to make just a little bit of modification on that to improve the underlying HTML similar to how we did it with um, with the new count. And so back in my index. So right now we're simply doing a check-in here. Um, we essentially just wanna wrap this with a little bit of uh, more HTML and uh, kind of include it with the item date. So we're gonna wrap that in additional small tag for now. And I'm waiting for that to update. So there we go. It's wrapped both our new and um, and the date. And we've added an additional span around the new tag. And we're just we're just setting ourselves up so that when we get to styling, some of these things are already in place. So just just a little tweak there is all we did to the HTML. Now let's see. The other thing, if we look at our uh, wireframe, is that for this main homepage view. We actually kind of do, at least in my opinion, you may decide to configure it differently, is we actually do kind of want to limit how many items show up. We've already got a couple levels of limitations going on in how we're representing this data. First, we're doing that um, limitation by last accessed, which is not a, quite a limitation. It's That's more to do with marking whether an item is new or not. We do have a limitation of how far back, um, we even want to fetch results. Because um, we don't want to fetch the whole history that is represented in its entirety in an RSS feed. That's what we did when we very, very first started this stream. But of course, that meant that we had like 20 or 30 items. And that didn't really make sense because for an RSS reader, a primary goal is that you really just want to know what's new, what's fresh, maybe what you missed from your favorite sources, right? So getting two years or more worth of data is not exactly useful. If you need to go back that far at that point, you know, we're going to provide you a link to quickly jump out to the original source. Um, so anyway, we've already got that limitation going on. And right now we've set it to 90 days, so approximately three months. You can kind of see that. Uh, represented depending on which source is happening here. So that's our limitation we already have, but that's um, a limitation on the global set of data. As far as our view on the home page, because we are going to have dedicated views both for the category as well as the individual source, um, in my view, this home page should be a quick scan to not only understand new items, but maybe just recent items for a source. So I would like to go ahead and limit this to uh, three as we are showing in our wireframes. So in order to do that, we're going to do yet another filter. Um, and I actually have a filter that we're going to use. Um, we are going to use this limit filter. Um, 
it's just definitely a handy one that I found where I want to reduce a larger source down to um, a, a limit that I set at the time that I'm outputting this filter. So we're just gonna go ahead and, and copy paste this into our config. So it's gonna take in an array and just simply do a slice on that and return the number that you pass in. So if we go back over, here is our section where we're outputting the individual feed items. So we're gonna pipe in our new limit filter and set it to three. And we're not gonna to see too much of a change because we don't have too much data, um, but a little bit of change. This used to have five, now it's down to three. And certainly uh, this list has shrunk as well. So little, little quick tweak there. That's to me though, <laughs> Little things like that are really show the power of what we have available with templating with 11D, where you can create something really quickly using familiar tools of, um, of JavaScript or be able to go out to a source like 11D Rocks and find a, a solution and, you know, within a few seconds, alter your data to mold it to what you need for your purposes. So I personally super love that about 11D. And um, I hope you pick up quite a few tips similar to that um, due to the different features we're adding to this application. Cool. So the other missing thing that we haven't quite done yet, if we look over here at our wireframe, is we haven't added this view all from modern CSS. And so the goal from that is to get us over to the individual source page. So in other words, we're going to be getting to the local, essentially archive page of that source. So we have a couple things to do there. First, we need to add the HTML for that. And again, keeping in mind that we're going to be styling this up in the next stream. So we're within our source list item. And at the bottom, we're going to add a footer element. Let me fix the formatting there. We're going to link it to the feed title and then add in our you know, initial title here, view all from. And we're passing in the site URL, but we want to create one more filter to scope that down to just show the domain, um, just to reduce kind of some visual clutter of what may have been originally passed in as the um, feed source domain. So I'm not going to save it yet or we'll hit an error, but you guessed it, back in 11D config, we're going to add this new domain filter. And I think I kind of skipped over mentioning it earlier, but this is just, you know, familiar JavaScript functions that is that is happening here. So anything that's available, you know, in JavaScript or is is available as you're creating your own functions here. So that really opens doors of of how you can transform content and 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 things. So you're using and we don't have to worry about you know, webpack or transfiling or any of this or browser compatibility because it's not getting done client side, it's getting done um, during the build process. So, you know, you're safe to use a little bit newer methods and things. All right, so we are, we are going to pass in the URL um, and then we're pulling out the host name and just in case we're going to pull off the www. So we'll save our filter and then come back and save the index so that that will show up and there you go. You can see um, how that's reduced down to the domain. And again, this is clicking through to our local um, view of that source. All right, so the other thing, if we look at our wireframes, this is the home page, and this is the individual category page. And if you notice, we're using the exact same markup um, between these two views. So wouldn't it be nice if that could be shared rather than duplicated? And yes, of course, we would, <laughs> we would love to make that modification. So what we're going to do is drop all of this, um, everything that is um, being output for the source. So all the source content, we're just gonna actually rip that out. And instead, we're going to create a partial for that to um, be rendered within. And so partials are similar to, partial is kind of a colloquial term, not an official term, but for 
creating bits of reusable template content. And so um, it's going to be placed in our includes directory because it is going to be included. <laughs> um, and 11D will automatically know to look in this directory. So we'll create the file. We're going to call it source card because um, ultimately it's going to be a card and, and that's what the content is here. Um, and here's the pretty cool part. Just going to reformat it. I'm not even going to change any of the variables or anything about this. All I'm going to do is set up my appropriate template syntax here. I'm going to do an include and we're going to pass the full file name spelled correctly of source card. Let it save and reload and it continued to work. So why did that continue to work? Because our partial is going to contextually pick up the data that it needs. So in other words, we're passing in this feed item and that's going to automatically get picked up in the partial and that gives it what it needs to do the rest of the, <laughs> to pull the rest of the data. So very, very, uh, you know, handy. It makes this reusable across our categories view, which we're going to update next and um, just really makes it more flexible. If we have edits in the future, now we can only make them in one place and it'll apply to both views, that kind of thing. So very, very handy feature. So, um, you know, just generically, it's, it's just an include. Um, but the way we're using it is to input a you know, partial amount of, of reusable template content. So again, that was held in the includes folder because that's where 11 is going to, by default, look for it when you use the include syntax. Cool. So we said we the other place we needed it was on our individual category pages, which we haven't updated at all. Those are currently just being, go ahead and copy this while I'm here. Um, those are currently being dynamically created via pagination. We talked about this um, towards the top of the stream. This is what we went through extensively in our previous streams about this project. And so if you're more interested in how pagination works, um, I think it was the third stream um, and those are located in the videos tab. They will be moved to YouTube. All right, just making sure everyone knew uh, you could find more information on how we did this. All right, so just like we saw for the home page, rather than outputting this actual link item, and now again, we're in our categories, so it's scoped down to this view and what's being output for each of these. Um, we'll swap that out and reuse our source card. So we saw that take hold, and now it also includes, of course, those other features that we worked on um, adding in here. And it also includes being limited to three items. So that really simplified our, our templating, really, um, you know, made this a little bit more manageable across our views and the different bits of data that we are, that we're creating. I think the last major thing that we ideally want to do in this stream, and we'll have to do just a couple more things um, when we do the styling stream, um, is on our individual source view, we would like to be able to just update what's happening in the, in the template here. So let's go ahead and go to the sources. And in this case, um, we look at our wireframe. Now at this point, we're no longer reusing this source card markup. We're actually finally going to output an excerpt because now we're scoped down to the individual items. And we also want to output um, a link that will take you off to that external original source. So that's the update we need to make um, for what is output in this content. Okay, so I'm going to, for the sake of time, copy and paste this update in, and then we can just do a quick review. So what I've updated it to render is H2s that are linked. We've added in our item excerpt, and then we've also um, set ourselves up so that we could again plan to use that inclusively hidden style that we haven't styled quite yet. Um, but the reason that's important is so that users of assistive technology wouldn't just hear view on modern CSS.dev, they would have the article title also inserted so they know what they're going to be viewing on, on that source. One thing I also removed just now is the post date. And the reason for that is we're going to create 
one more little tiny partial that just includes our post date. And because we do share this format across this view and also the source card. So in my includes, I'm going to create post date. And that's going to include our markup that checks for if the item is new to output that. And then just, just simply does our post date item here. So now that we have that partial, we will include it in our sources and that's going to go prior to um, the title. Make sure that saves and comes in. So there we go. Um, if it was a new item, so let's go to small CSS. So you can see uh, when it is a new item, you know, that's going to get rendered. And then as I mentioned, we're going to swap that within our uh, source card to just keep that in alignment. So just another way that we can, um, you know, reduce duplication of, of things as much as we can. So we, what we just accomplished was improving the source view. For our individual source view, we'd ideally like to bring in that new uh, number. And we'd also ideally like to link out to this original source. But because of how we currently have this feeding into our base template, right now we're just passing a title. And so how are we going to modify what gets displayed there? Well, we're going to borrow an idea that we did for items, which is to expand what gets passed in our 11D computed. So again, this ultimately gets used in a similar way as if we were kind of handcrafting this view and adding front matter. Um, so we're going to expand this and we're going to also enable it to pass into our layout view um, the site URL. Now that's not gonna do anything quite yet, it's just making that data available. And so in our base template, we're going to add a check around our title and we're gonna check if that site URL exists because for our homepage and our category page, it's not going to exist. So essentially it's currently, only going to um, exist if we're looking at an individual source page. And then we're going to modify what happens for a source. So we're going to change our H1 to include um, the site URL. So that's where that comes into play. And then we also want our new count. So this is the other reason we created our new count as a short code. If you missed that, that was about uh, almost the first thing we did in this stream after our summary. So we're going to be able to pass in the title and we can actually, um, interestingly, we can use a filter on a bit of data that gets passed into a short code. So whereas on the home page we explored how to set that, um, we are able to pipe that in directly as well as an alternate option. Now it's worked in the sense that we now have this title linked. This particular source has no new item. So let's look at small CSS, which does. And there we go. So we now have the underpinning HTML that we'll need to style up this view. So we got we got almost everything done that I wanted to get through today. Um, we didn't quite get to um, we're going to modify the header for an individual source. So we'll do that at the top of the stream before we get into styling. That won't take too long. Um, but I hope you learned a lot about filters in particular today and short codes. I definitely encourage you again to look back at the previous streams to understand a little bit more about the other critical parts that are making this work in regards to pagination. And um, in particular, the more advanced use case we had for pagination, which was being able to do at that moment in time, filter the source coming in, um, which makes for a lot more flexibility in how you're able to consume content and create dynamic views with 11D. So very handy feature. Um, and we, we really dove into that in our previous streams. We talked about partials and saw how those could help us reduce duplication, make content you know more flexible across what we're using it for. And in particular, we saw how it was kind of, kind of pretty awesome that a partial will will intake its data kind of contextually. So we were for this particular one. Let's jump back to that view. We were able to keep our existing loop, and our partial is going to pick up that feed and continue to be able to use it. There was no additional 
modifications needed. We didn't have to set any additional variables. It just was able to use it um, just contextually, which is pretty awesome.